I'd like to cover a little bit of internal validity issues uh, that uh, pose threats to uh, interpreting a regression. Uh, if there are serious internal validity issues, it means that the coefficients that one has estimated of the relationship between explanatory variables and outcome variables, well, they just aren't valid, and so there's no point in talking about them. Um, so it's important to know what these validity issues are, to identify them, and to correct for them if possible. So basically, the idea is we, we want our estimates to be unbiased uh, if we're going to estimate these coefficients. And uh, we also want our standard errors and confidence intervals to be correctly calculated. And those issues, uh, that is, we will have bias and we won't be having correct standard errors and hence confidence intervals when there's a problem with internal validity. So, uh, so the usual things that we identify uh, for bias in particular is what we're focusing on. For, uh, for bad standard errors, there's, there's actually a whole host of uh, issues that can arise, uh, and we'll just look very briefly at when we have correlation of errors across observations. The uh, the bias issues, however, uh, we, we've discussed more extensively, omitted variable bias, misspecification of the functional form, measurement error in X, missing data, where we have sample selection bias, and simultaneous causality. So I won't talk about them all here, just about some of them. Let's uh, go with omitted variable bias. We remember from Chapter 6 in uh, Stock and Watson that we have a formula for estimating, uh, for, for thinking about omitted variable bias, that's on page uh, 182, and it tells us that as the sample size gets large, so as, the, as we go to the probability limit, uh, our uh, expectation of the, of the coefficient um, that we estimate goes to the true coefficient plus the correlation between x and the error term times the standard deviation of the uh, error term divided by the standard deviation of x. So this, this correlation that really matters, if the error term and x, say, are positively correlated, then we're going to have a positive bias. Our, our beta 1 hat is going to be bigger than our beta 1. Uh, it's going to be too high. And we can illustrate that with the simple diagram that uh, we've been using in class when if what we what we have is a true estimate, uh, or sorry, our true relationship between x and y. If, however, we have a correlation between x and u that's positive, that means that for high values of x, we are going to have errors that are, that are high, that are positive, and for low values of x, we're going to have errors that are low, uh, or maybe negative. So that's what we're going to observe. So when we fit our line, we're going to fit a line that's too steep. Our beta is going to be too high. So if the correlation between the error term and x is positive, we're going to overestimate our slope. Our slope is going to be too, too steep. That's omitted variable bias. Uh, what do we do? What are the solutions to omitted variable bias? Well, we can include the omitted variable if we have it. If we don't have the omitted variable, we include control variables so that we then have conditional mean independence. Uh, we can use a panel of data where we're observing uh, observations repeatedly over time so that we're controlling for the... Uh, uh, the unobserved factors, uh, the omitted variables that are constant over time uh, and are affecting individual uh, outcomes. We c and that, that, those uh, methods and techniques are in, are in chapter 10. We can also use a technique called instrumental variables that's in chapter 11. So we won't be covering those in this, in this course. And then, of course, we can do a randomized control trial because for a randomized control trial, by definition, we're randomizing the X, the treatment, so the correlation between the treatment and the error term is zero in a randomized control trial, so we have no bias by definition in a randomized control trial, of course, unless we do things wrong in our randomized control trial, which, which can often happen. So that's omitted variable bias, one of the important threats to validity. Uh, another important threat to validity is, is simultaneous causality, and that's where we have a set of relationships like this. So we have y depends on x, but x depends on y. 
And you know this from Econ 1, supply and demand, uh, that uh, price depends on supply uh, and price depends on demand. Uh, so price and, and the quantity are both endogenous. The price depends on the quantity supplied and quantity supplied depends on the price. Um, so, so you know about this simultaneous causality. We see it all the time in economics. Um, if we just think of it in terms of the econometric issue, though, if the error term if u is high in, in this equation, then the outcome y is high. If the outcome y is high, then the x is high, and so then we have a correlation between x and u. I'll say it again. If, if u is high, then y will be high, but if y is high, we plug it in here, we have a high y, we get a high x. So now we have this correlation between x and u. Um, that violates one of our assumptions, one of our key assumptions in ordinarily squares for being unbiased. Uh, and if we go back to the formula, right, we'll see if there's a correlation between x and u, then there's bias in the uh, estimate. So thinking about our test score example, if the um, error in the in our normal equation, if, if uh, you have a high error here, then the test score will be high, but we might have a relationship where the superintendent of schools says that when test scores are high, we have higher student-teacher ratio, because those schools are doing well, so they don't need low student-teacher ratios. We don't have to spend money with a lot more um, teachers for those schools, because they're already doing well. So then we'll have a correlation between the error term and the student-teacher ratio, which will then bias the coefficient beta 1 that we're, that we're estimating. So that's simultaneous causality bias, solved the same way that omitted variable bias is, is solved, by um, running a randomized control trial, by using instrumental variables, uh, by using a panel can get around some of these issues, uh, and we leave those for uh, future, future class. So we're just introducing the concept here. Um, Misspecification functional form is pretty straightforward. Uh, if, uh, if our data is, is nonlinear, right, um, so our data looks like that. Uh, if we estimate a linear function, we'll get a slope like that. Uh, if we estimate the true functional form, we get a slope like that. Plainly, the betas there are quite different, and we need to appreciate that uh, our data is not always going to be uh, linear. Measurement error, I've uh, got a separate video on that, uh, the same with missing data and having sample selection bias, so I'll leave you to read about those and, and watch those other two um, videos. Uh, and finally, we come to when our standard errors are estimated incorrectly. Um, when we have correlation of errors across observations, we'll end up with a situation typically where our estimated standard error will then be too small. And I want to just show that to you very briefly. We'll not spend too much time on this, but just understanding the idea is important. So imagine we have a regression where the amount of hours you know, people study in a week, say, your, your sort of study habits is a function beta 0 plus beta 1 times the quality of your high school. So kids who come from high quality high schools maybe study more than, than other kids because um, they've been trained in the importance of uh, spending you know a lot of hours a week uh, studying. Uh, and of course there's some variation. So if we took a sample of students at a university, a random sample, and they'd come from different quality high schools, we'd estimate beta 1, uh, it would have an associated standard error, we'd conduct hypothesis tests and things like that. But if the errors are correlated, um, then we're going to be fitting to the observed so if the errors are correlated, it will um, uh, look like the, the residuals are, are small. Uh, so this might be our true relationship and our true distribution of observations. So we have all these observations, and that's our true relationship. But suppose we, for some reason, end up with a sample where the errors are correlated so that they're generally high. So our sample will consist of these observations where all the errors are correlated and they're all higher. So we estimate a line and, and notice that this the red line that we estimate, it's uh, uh, the distribution of the errors around it is much smaller than the than the distribution of the of the general errors. Notice also that if we 
uh, had a sample where the errors are correlated and they were generally negative, uh, we'd get the uh, other side, we'd have an uh, estimate of the slope, um, and uh, the errors would be tightly distributed around the, uh, around the slope estimate. So if the errors are correlated, it's going to look like we have a very precise uh, estimate with, with very low standard error of the coefficient that we're uh, estimating. But that's, that's plainly not the case, right? The standard error should, should be much higher. The, the true errors are dispersed uh, more, more broadly. So when we have correlated errors, this would be a problem for the precision of our estimates. It'll look like they're too precise. Um, and corrections for that we'll uh, leave for another time.